I'm Bro Russell, the director of the Cartoonist Rights Network International. I'm here with Susie Cagle at the occasion of the Convention of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists and the annual award for Courage in Editorial Cartooning that uh, Cartoonist Rights Network gives out every year. Susie is one of our clients. She was arrested in a demonstration in Oakland almost exactly a year ago as part of the um, part of the Occupy Wall Street movement that migrated across the country. Uh, Susie, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, starting with what has happened to you and the arrest that you endured last year up until today's date? Uh, well... Just in the context of the legal legal things you've been embroiled with. Sure. Um, it's It's been a, a strange journey, and it's kind of... Uh, unclear where things stand now. Um, I was arrested on a, a misdemeanor, a Satan release misdemeanor, so they could have even just given me a ticket. There's no reason to take me to jail under the law. Um, and uh, I was uh, arraigned um, about a month later, um, but just kind of blown off then. They didn't press charges, but they didn't drop charges. And I was in contact with the um, local police department that had arrested me, and um, they actually said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk to the district attorney, we're gonna get this dropped, and then I never heard again. And I was in touch with them, you know, a couple weeks later, and said, what's going on with this? And they uh, they insisted that they had talked to the district attorney that it was dropped, and since then I've been in touch with the district attorney. Uh, two or three times and they have no record of it being dropped and they're somewhat hostile and not easy to work with uh, on any of this. Um, so, so let me interrupt Susie. Sure. Why aren't you subject to a fair and speedy trial in this case? Because they aren't pressing charges. They And, and this is something that um, they, they hold people hostage in this kind of legal limbo where they refuse to actually to really drop the charges and they refuse to press the charges and um, when you talk to them about this legal limbo they insist that it is not a legal limbo they're they're <laughs> waiting out the statute of limitations and for me the statute of limitations will run out as arrested on November um, November 3rd early morning November 3rd last year and statute of limitations will run out a year from that date, so in about a month and a half. Um, but they are, they, they hold this over people's heads, and, and they hold this over people's heads so that they feel intimidated to go back to a future demonstration for whatever reason. Um, so this is the traditional chilling effect that a uh, government can sometimes uh, uh, put onto a journalist to keep them from reporting. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting that it's it's on, this is only happening in Oakland this kind of legal limbo thing. In New York, they uh, I know journalists who were arrested in New York and they were um, arraigned and actually had an opportunity to speak with a judge. When I I had my arraignment date, we went and they just said, "Oh, well you're not you're not up today." Like you show up for your court date and they say never mind on that day. Um it's an odd situation, and I and it's um, so much of this. I think that it is a, a combination of incompetence and like genuine hostility. Um, I think that there's a lot of disorganization there. Oakland certainly has a lot of other problems going on, and they're arresting hordes and hordes of people in these situations all at the same time. It's creating a giant paperwork mess for them. Um, but they have no interest in cleaning it up, and I think that they, in a way, they use it against people. Yeah. This is certainly an example of how local police uh, with the local judicial system can circumvent your First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. uh, why hasn't there been more hue and cry about this in the American press? I, you would think the American press would be the first institution that would be uh, really concerned about this. It was, it's been very interesting. In New York, I mean, when I was arrested, kind of, uh, I was not the first journalist to be arrested during the Occupy movement, but I was kind of early on. And um, 
I think that people were shocked and they didn't quite know what to think about it. They didn't quite know what to do. The people, I think, presume close to the best about America. I think that we generally presume that that kind of thing does not happen, that when you're out in a, in a public square in front of the city hall that and you're trying to do your job as a journalist, that you are not going to risk going to jail for the next day. Um, and so people kind of presume that you did something to deserve it. Ah, There's, this sounds familiar. We find cases all over the world where governments and local laws are used against cartoonists uh, in situations where the government actually knows that they're not standing on any kind of valid grounds. They know that this will eventually be thrown out of court. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, the cartoonist is not drawing those nasty cartoons anymore. Exactly. And the cartoonist is spending their family's fortune defending themselves. And so the effect, the, the legal foundation of the charges are bogus and everybody knows it. But the effect is the effect the government wants. But these are governments like, uh, you know, uh, Robert Mugabe's government in uh, Zimbabwe and uh, Turkey. This is used all the time. And uh, the Middle East, Egypt uh, uses this technique constantly to quiet its journalists. Well, Oakland, Oakland is a particular place in America. And what, what I saw, you know, maybe a couple weeks, I think it was a couple weeks after I was arrested, many journalists were arrested in New York and journalists from mainstream organizations, Associated Press, National Public Radio, right. and that's, I feel like that's when things, the opinion changed a little bit. What really changed and what was interesting for me to see from across the country is the media was pissed off. In New York, they all banded together, they wrote very strongly worded letters, they were talking about it all the time. In the Bay Area, I had journalists who were poking fun at me while I was in jail on, on Twitter and social media, ha ha, she got, she, she's in jail, ha ha, um, and nobody, no local press wrote about it or covered it at all. I was actually, um, no, that's not true, one, one little TV spot, and that was it, but, but it was, it was kind of shocking to me. What was more shocking is that, um, three months later, I was arrested again. Uh, also covering another demonstration, um, and it was actually an even crazier situation. I was um, I was thrown. Um, there's this amazing video. The the police were um, beating this man, and I was um, recording it, audio recording it, and they saw me and turned around and threw me over this man whose legs that they had just broken. Um, oh yeah, and uh, and I had a, a cop hand shaped bruise on my arm and my arm was numb and uh, pushed just shoved me around and then um, and arrested me and um, the whole time that I was insisting when I was a journalist they they kept saying cooperate cooperate because I was not cooperating because I was saying that I was a journalist and I was not cooperating oh my God. Um, but in that situation it wasn't just me they arrested five other reporters who all worked for a variety of publications, some mainstream, you know, an alternative weekly, Mother Jones magazine. And because it was six of us, people paid attention. But they didn't care more. They didn't get in the press more. People didn't pay attention more. They weren't disturbed more. Which is a good point to segue into a number that Reporters Sound Frontier has issued. Would you explain that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Um, and this came out, I think it was even bef right, right before those arrests, like a couple days before, they said that um, America's uh, freedom of press ranking in the world had dropped from 20 to 47 in directly because of these arrests of journalists who are attempting to cover Occupy protests. Did you hear that, America? <laughs> we're no longer at the top of the pile on free press. We're number 47. I wonder who, uh, what kind of company we're keeping at that level. I, yeah, I, I need yeah. to look. Right, sure right, right above Putin's savory. Russia, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, what do you see uh, uh, is going to happen in your particular situation, how this is going to eventually be resolved or not for you personally? I... 
I don't really expect any resolution. You know, I I tried my my administrative routes in in the city in terms of internal affairs and citizens police review, and they found that the police acted proper and correct and right, and that there was absolutely nothing that they did wrong whatsoever. Um, so I'm I mean I'm just really waiting for the statute of limitations to run out. And then, and that's when I will feel like at least that is resolved. But at the same time, I don't feel like, in a way, as long as I'm in Oakland and I'm covering local events and certainly local protests, which I will continue to do, um, this is going to be a continuing problem. I mean, this is uh, every time that they've arrested a large amount of people, I've been there and, and two of the three times I've been caught up in it because I, it's important to me to be in, the, uh, in these conflict areas uh, in, in America and to be yeah. seeing this and, and witnessing it and documenting it in a variety of ways. Um, including cartoons. Including cartoons. I, yeah. uh, whenever I can, I, I, I break out a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's even just um, May 1st, there was, it was another day of, of lots of action around Oakland, and I wasn't arrested, but I, a, pol a policeman on a motorcycle chased me on a sidewalk for about 400 yards, and I just ran for my life. What kind of an ID identifies you as a journalist during these encounters, and why isn't it being observed? Um, I have, uh, at this point, I have, I have a police-issued press pass, um, but the police don't know what their police-issued press pass looks like. When they arrested me in January, I had one, and they looked at it and looked at it and were just puzzling over it, and I said, that's yours. It's, it's signed by the current police chief. You can see it's got the low city logo, and they just could not make sense of it. They just didn't know what it looked like. Um, and, uh, so I have that, which is also helpful, and I, um, I also have a press pass from the, um, the Freelancers Guild, um, union, which is a division of the, um, Pacific Newspaper yeah. Guild, um, and it doesn't I, much matter, you know, this no. stuff hangs around your neck, and, and they... The in front of you doesn't uh, really know what to do or how to treat it or whether they should observe it or not. I'm particularly upset that it uh, seems to be a local police chief determining who will and will not be protected by the First Amendment. Yes. And, and I think that, that's outrageous. Yes, and that's, in January, that was the most interesting thing, to see, okay, there's six of us, and we are in a really broad range of, you know, the woman from the San Francisco Chronicle and woman from the mainstream radio station, but then woman from the alternative weekly newspaper and me who they also knew and I was um and and they were um they knew that they were picking me up again and they were really pissed off about it and were, were giving me crap of saying like you again um but there was this broad range of people and we were all treated very differently let, let me step back a minute a little bit earlier we were talking about something before the camera started rolling about what the real crisis is, uh, kind of in a, in a macrocosm, uh, suddenly we have reporters that are coming out of cyberspace and the laws, uh, you know, we're about journalism and who gets to be a journalist and not are, were invented years and years and years, generations before that. Can you make a comment on this, you know, this kind of convergence of these two streams. It's kind of a culture clash in, in media right now and I think it's uh, I think it's incredibly interesting. Um, these the definitions are our, our definitions uh, legal definitions of what what a journalist is um, who supposedly gets these extra protections um, were made up before media was happening on the internet. They were also made up before a lot of people were losing their jobs, before we had fewer reporters who were, would be in a position to be paid to go into these situations and document them. And those formerly paid people are now being replaced in a lot of situations by individuals who are, have, are personally passionate about wanting to go out and document things, citizen journalists. Yeah. And uh, they, they either do it completely for free, or they're raising money online. People have raised 
uh, tens of thousands of dollars, some of them, to be able to do this and be and buy their equipment. Um, and you know, the the mayor of Oakland in uh, February or, or March, uh, I believe, um, called them fake journalists, fake media. And we need yeah. to figure out a way to separate them yeah. from the real journalists, which just, it, it really goes to show this kind of deep misunderstanding of of what's happening in media right now we're we're in a state of total disruption and uh in the press and in these jobs and uh those fake journalists are often um i know for a fact those fake journalists go out they take all the video the real journalists sit on their butts at home and they watch it on their computers (laughs) and they write articles and get paid (laughs) but they're real Right. Well, once a, a, a person like a mayor or a police chief calls them fake journalists, it also gives license to the police to ignore their their rights as journalists. It's like saying we don't recognize your journalists, you know, into the paddy wagon with you and off to jail. And, you know, that's kind of when I was arrested the first time, um, I, my, my arresting officer didn't, you know, I told him all the places I was working for four different places that day, uh, and, and he had never heard of any of them. Um, and then another officer walked up and goes, looks at my press pass, and says, oh, Susie Cagle, you're the cartoonist. Oh, well, nice. <laughs> and walks away. Oh, right. As I'm yeah, standing go ahead, there, zip Hit her on the head. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and then... I know her. <laughs> It was really interesting to see how um, the police have reacted to, you know, there's there's uh, no local cartoonist in Oakland, and to suddenly be faced with it with this woman who's coming around and drawing us, uh, with it, it freaked them out more than I ever would have anticipated that it would. Um, well, the, the police all over the United States are uh, uh, grabbing cell phones out of uh, citizens' hands, confiscating their work, giving their phone back a day later with everything erased. Uh, and again, uh, to me, it seems like nobody is challenging this and nobody is uh, doing anything about it, but they didn't confiscate your sketchbook, did they? No, they held it for a couple <laughs> of days. I didn't know, you know, they take all your stuff away, they hold it in evidence. Um, right. And so I, I got it back a couple of days later, right. I got all my stuff back. And they hadn't erased your uh, drawings? No, they hadn't <laughs> torn everything out. Well, and <laughs> Anyway, Susie, thank you very much. It's been wonderful spending uh, some time with you uh, a year after the fact. Uh, I know a lot of organizations wrote letters on your behalf a year ago. Did any of that have any influence? Uh, yes and no. I think that it reached a point where they they couldn't ignore it, um, and they realized that they had to deal with it, and that's that was about a few weeks after I was arrested when they called me up and said, oh, we finally just realized how bad this was. And they, and they apologized. But they and then they did it again. And then they didn't drop it. Apologized, but didn't drop the charges. Yeah. Susie, thank you very much. We hope to hear from you again in some more positive situations. <laughs> uh, it's very nice for you to be here at the convention and to attend our award ceremonies last night. You accepted the award for Courage and Editorial Cartooning on behalf of our winner, Asim Trevidi, in India. And we have already sent off to him the uh, speech that Drew read. Uh, and we thank you very much. Well, thank you. I mean, you say that people aren't aren't uh, concerned about this stuff. But, I mean, we're here talking about yeah. it. And I, and I have to believe that we're going to reach a tipping point where, where more people are aware and, and more people are disturbed and they want to do something. Good. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Bye-bye.